Welcome everybody to Economic Development Week. It's the week we've been waiting for eagerly. Uh, this is the ECDEV Network and I'm Dan Taylor. I'm going to pass it over to Bob to kick off our week of wonderful clubhouse calls. Oop, there. Thank you, Dan. Sometimes my chubby fingers can't find that mute button. I'm so sorry. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm so glad to have all of you here with us. My name is Bob Minhas. I'm one of the co-hosts today with uh, Laura Fritz and Dan Taylor. Uh, you're in the Economic Development Room, and today we're going to talk about uh, the topic of community building. Now, before we get right into the topic, I just want to set the room to make sure we're all in the same place. Well, welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining us. Now, uh, just to let you guys know, this session is being recorded. Dan is amazing at leveraging it as a podcast, so it helps us reach more and more people, which is a, a wonderful thing. Uh, as I mentioned, the theme today under economic development is community building, and we'll get into really what that is for economic developers, but also community builders as well. My name is Bob Minhas. I help economic development teams build knowledge economies. And I'll let Dan and Lara do their intros when they're ready. Now, if you haven't already, uh, we've sort of brought up some of the speakers on stage, but I always say the people on our stage are generally really smart people. So if you haven't already, be sure to check out their bio. I know Ryan is still filling his in. Uh, and make sure you follow them because these are people we generally see in other clubhouse rooms sharing their, their wonderful knowledge and asking amazing questions. As we get going, guys, if you hear some things that uh, really resonate with you, on the very bottom of the screen, you'll see a plus sign. That's the ping button. You can actually ping and invite colleagues and coworkers or heck, even family and friends to join us here in the room and join us in the discussion. The more we have, the more we love because you know we love hearing you guys share as opposed to us doing all the sharing as well. Um, once you do jump on stage, uh, just so you know, if you want to get on stage on the very bottom, you'll see a hand icon with a notepad. When you press that, that indicates you're raising your hand. And if you have a question or a comment or just want to share, press that button. That'll allow myself and Dan or Lara to bring you on stage. Now, keep in mind, as soon as we bring you on stage, your mic is going to be hot and live. So as soon as you jump on, just hit that mute button right away. Emily, great to see you. Great to see Emily here as well. Um, and for those of you that are on stage, a few of you I know are a little bit newer, so here are a couple tips. If you hear something that you really resonate with, when you press your mute button super quick on and off, it indicates clapping. Now, if you popcorn your uh, mute button, which basically means you slowly alternate it, that tells us that you have something you want to share. And that allows myself, Dan and Lara, to ensure that we give, uh, give you space to be able to share what you'd like. And if you are going to share, uh, it's really helpful for those in the rest of the room to just announce your name when you're done and say, I'm done speaking. So once you've shared what you want to share, being able to say, I'm Ryan and I'm done speaking. That ensures that someone else who wants to jump in has that perfect timing. Um, if you haven't yet, be sure to follow the economic development room itself. We're hosting a session every day this week at noon, except Friday. We're going to do it at three o'clock on Friday just to be different and to ensure that our friends in the Pacific Coast can jump in more easily. Uh, that's all I have to share about that. Now, before I jump into the first question, Lara and Dan, did you have anything you wanted to share before I jump in the first question? Maybe introduce yourself a little? Sure. Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, I'm Dan Taylor, and I uh, run economic development for the town of Innisfil, just north of Toronto. And I'm also a strategic advisor and guide to those in the economic development profession. I'm finding a lot of interest in, um, I do a lot of co-creation on briefs and strategic planning where uh, it's more tailored and customized, and there's some, some great interest in that. Um, uh, after Lara, and not to put uh, Emily on the spot, but she's got some great background on our topic, so we'd love to engage her as well at some point in time. Bob, thank you. I'm done speaking. Thank you. I will definitely call in Emily first. Lara, please share a little bit about yourself, and then I'll jump right in. Hi, everyone. I'm Lara Fritz, and I have been in economic development for 25 years, having done everything in economic development from uh, running a Main Street program to a large city department. <laughs> And I am so excited about this topic today and, of course, very excited about Economic Development Week as I serve on the board of the International Economic Development Council. So thank you for everyone attending today. And Bob, I'll hand it back to you. I'm Laura Fritz and done speaking. Thank you, Lara. Just really quick, I wanted to welcome our newcomers here, Ebony, Jane, Daniel and Carissa. Sue, great to see you again. Emily, if you're ready, I'd love to throw this topic to you, with, starting with the first question, just to help all, everyone get on the same page, which is, let's define what is community building. Or, Emily, how would you define 
community building. Yeah, thank you, oh, Bob, oh, and thank you, Dan and Laura, for hosting this. For context, everyone, my name is Emily Legal. I'm a graduate of the University of Iowa School of Urban and Regional Planning with a focus in economic development and then community development. And then I also serve as executive director for Northwest Illinois Economic Development in the Galena area. Um, I just find community building and economic development in this case as empowering people and organizations to take on leadership roles and build a sense of community and connection and growth. And it's mostly just about empowerment for others, because in the end, one of the tenets is that we don't always know what's best for these people. And it's up to them to help decide and show them that they can decide what's best. That's a great distinction, Emily. Thank you for, for pointing that out. I'm going to double back over to Dan and Lara because I'd love to hear a Canadian and a, and a U.S. perspective as well. Lara, can I come back to you and ask you, how, how do you define community building, maybe building off Emily's point or bringing your own point? Yeah, so, you know, I, I really agree with Emily. But what I think is community building, people want to live in cool places. And as a result, it's everything we can do as economic development professionals to make sure that the community that we are doing our economic development work in is a place where employees want to live. So uh, often I see economic development programs that are very singularly focused on the economic development piece, but we also need to be focusing on the community building itself to attract the workers. I'm Laura Fritz and I'm done speaking. That's a great addition. I love that that extra part as well, Lara. Dan, from your perspective, how can people community build? Yeah, so this is it's not that it's a tricky question, but it's 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 fascinating. So I think community building is and absolutely has to be at the heart of economic development. Uh, when I heard Lara speak, it, it sort of brought me back to this idea that Richard Florida, you know, taught us in the early 2000s about quality of place. And, um, and, and there's the trick is to straddle not only in your community building to build a wonderful quality of place for the employees and the employers, but also for the citizens and to somehow stay true uh, to the community. Uh, I've been in one community in particular where there's been dramatic change. And while I think it was relatively true, it was still a bit of a, a shock and a change. So uh, to me, community building is absolutely engaging the community, having them be part of the process, help them guide the process. One of my tangents that I think uh, I'm going to paraphrase or use slightly different words than Emily uses, but is leading without authority, which is deciding as a community member or, or as a, an empowerment body that people are empowered. Uh, and in fact, I don't know that people need to be empowered. I think they just decide to be empowered and lead segments or sub segments of the community. Um, big topic. Would love to go deeper as we continue. I'm Dan, and I'm done speaking. That, that's some really great additional insight as well. Uh, Jen, you've just jumped on stage to join us. Did you want a conversation? And then I'd love to throw it over to Jason when you're ready. Um, yeah, sure. I was just listening to some of the great things that Laura and Dan and others were saying, and it reminds me that I also come from um, kind of a background in community development. I have a, a master's in planning from the University of Cincinnati. And I think some of this um, for me connects to how we define economic development. Um, you know, some define that in, in, in very uh, sparse terms in the community. I think most economic developers are aligned with community development and planning. But um, I also think that in the community, there sometimes exists um, you know, the idea that economic development is just about investment or just about adding any jobs. Um, and, and when you come at it from the perspective of um, focusing around um, the, the people, <laughs> um, then, you know, it changes your perspective somewhat. Um, so that's just a, a comment I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That's that's some I put you up on the stage. Quite a bit of work in social entrepreneurship. I month across dealing and building communities. I, you know, I'd love if you have some. Uh, 
No, I appreciate it. No, this is my first time joining in, so thank you. I'm based in Denver, Colorado now. I grew up in South Bend, Indiana. I uh, got to serve overseas working for the U.S. government on federal programs. So, yeah, I've got pretty wide exposure, and I'm uh, particularly interested in, in, you know, community building uh, in the sense that, you know, it's about uh, – you know, community participation, uh, stakeholder engagement, and, and ways to improve on that for, you know, attracting attracting investment, doing the right things with planning. Uh, I guess a sense of place, you know, the history of the place, um, you know, a big part of uh, the community building is, is, you know, now more being in touch with environmental justice, than, you know, considering those those aspects of the geography around the region. So, yeah, there's lots to learn as I'm, I'm doing a work with opportunity zones now and um, in different places where I've never visited. So it's always uh, interesting now to engage in different ways uh, remotely um, to put the pieces together that we're all kind of interconnected. So it's, it's tough work, but, you know, community participation is critical in, in trying to do the right things in these communities. So appreciate it. And I appreciate that you guys are from all over the place, uh, Canada and Illinois. So uh, it's good to join in through Clubhouse. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jason, for your insights as well. Yeah, we're really trying to make it global, but this week with International Economic Development Week, we're, we're really crossing borders and boundaries. Of course, those internationally are probably so asleep, but we're hoping they'll jump in on the, the podcast after. So with that, I wanted to jump into the next question, which Emily kind of started us down the path of. And Dan, I'm going to throw this this next question to you. But you know, when we work in economic development, there's sometimes a bit of confusion or not, lack of clarity on the distinction between economic development and community building. Do you have sort of a, a, a point of clarity or a point of insight, Dan, on how you dis, you distinct the two? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. So, what I would I'll start with economic development. At the core of economic development, the ultimate deliverables or KPIs are, were you successful in um, having investment? So I'm, I'm going to suggest having investment, meaning helping uh, current businesses stay in business and grow, attract new business, create jobs, and build a tax base. So if you were to define economic development at its core, that's its stripped down version. And then what Lara and Emily and I think others uh, were alluding to is you also need this quality of place, which is you need nice amenities, parks, um, citizen engagement. And not that those things are not economic development, but somewhere <laughs> there's a, a line of fuzzy blurriness. Uh, and I don't know that you ever cross over to pure economic development or pure community building. I think they do totally intersect. And depending on the community, they maybe even intersect more and deeply than less. Um, you know, when I think of community building, I think of uh, other other types of amenities and, you know, Soft assets, and the word soft is a terrible word, so I can't, I can't think of a, a, a better term at the moment. I'm sure someone else can. But maybe it's libraries, it's community groups, it's a health and well-being of the community, affordable housing. But as you hear me talk, it's hard to differentiate uh, between the two. But some, I think there's some, on the extremes, there's sort of this purity or simplicity of what each is. And then I think there's this big middle that they meet in. Um, I'm Dan and I'm done speaking. Really great point, Dan. That's true. Laura, did you, did you want to add to that as well from your perspective? Yeah. So I see economic development as jobs and investment um, and sort of the, the large company, larger projects that, you know, we as economic development professionals always aspire to. Um, that being said, those large projects don't happen if you don't have solid community building. And what I mean by that is, again, going back to people want to live in cool places, if you don't have a community that people want to live in, then it is very difficult to have talent. And let's be honest, those big projects are looking for the talent. Do you have residents who are skilled 
to take the jobs if we bring them to your community. And so you have to make your community attractive to the worker, whether that's you know, having coffee shops, restaurants, stores, um, the amenities, as Bob talked about, parks, public art, but just at that sense of place has become so important. Um, and it becomes really important as we talk about talent. How do you bring talent to your community? You do it by having affordable housing or housing that's attractive. Um, and so that's where the community building becomes really important. And I think very often there is a, a, a definitive line that's drawn between economic development and community development. And yet they are so intertwined. What I really enjoyed about my work in Salt Lake is that I oversaw three components. I oversaw the economic development, the bringing the big projects in, really important, loved it, created jobs for our community. But then I was also responsible for the redevelopment agency, which was doing things like infrastructure investment, public art investment, helping to build affordable housing in our community, which was that community piece. And then the last was I oversaw arts and culture. And so we were hosting events. We, were, we had an art gallery that we managed. Um, we managed the city's public art collection. And so having that comprehensive approach to economic development really helped us be able to build a program of work that was holistic and not just focused on the big fish chasing, which is important. I don't want to discount it. But it, it can't be done in isolation. It needs to be done part of a holistic economic development program. And I'm Laura Fritz, and I'm done speaking. Laura, thank you. That's some really helpful insight as well. Sheena, I saw that you had your mic open. Did you want to contribute to the conversation? Yeah, and, absolutely. And I love um, that you're an urban planner. I'm excited to hear your point of view from here as well. Yeah, I'm actually an urban planner. So I graduated from the University of Calgary. But my main focus is uh, nighttime economies. I'm also a DJ. So I managed to kind of meld the two sort of cultural and urban planning aspects together in my business. Um, and recently, we've just kind of been talking about um, night economies and how it's very difficult to um, extricate money from the cultural value that it brings. Um, and that's why a lot of people, I think, when it comes to community building, have kind of a problem understanding how they could both work together hand in hand. Just because a lot of times when arts programs are on the table or um, there's any sort of talk about um, expanding the nighttime economy, it's always just really at the end of the line, bottom line driven by dollars. Um, so I think that there is a lot of other value that can be placed in these communities. Like for instance, in nighttime economies, um, the LGBT2 key, to uh, QT2S plus community. There's a lot of like um, community building and social infrastructure within, within there that, can, that you can't put a dollar on. So um, I also find that that's very interesting with the economic development and arts and culture. My name is Sheena and I'm done speaking. Thank you. Sheena, that's a really great perspective. I don't think we've really had a discussion around those communities and economic development. Dan, did you want to add to the conversation? Yeah, thanks, Bob. So um, I'd like to touch a little bit on what Sheena said and build on what Laura was saying. Laura was saying. So uh, my background is working at marketing agencies, and you know, marketing used to be just advertising, just promotion, et cetera, et cetera. And then they started talking about integrated marketing. In our organization today, we talk about um, cross-functionality. So I think uh, the kind of role that Lara was talking about is probably um, the kind of role that we need moving forward in building our community's viability, whether that's through quality of life, economies, etc., because they are so intertwined. And I'm, you know, it, it, it's almost like if you have too many titles, for lack of a better term, you're creating division versus unity. So I really like the idea that we look at growing a community holistically, and there are, you know, piece parts to that. There's, you know, the housing slash, you know, quality of life. There's the arts and culture and the lifeblood and the vibrancy in the parks. And then there is the economy and, and the jobs, etc. cetera. And um, I want to touch a little bit on what Sheena was talking about. So 
I think, unfortunately, and I don't really know why, in Ontario, I've seen many stats about the value of culture. And it, it, the value is significant. Like, it's not, it's not like uh, single-digit percentages. It's, it's quite significant. And, again, I go back to this term, soft, and if anyone's got a better term, they've got to help me out here. You know, I think, unfortunately, our, you know, arts and culture is seen as, you know, a, a soft thing, but it, it's not soft. Uh, Lara pointed out that people, talent, right, is attracted to quality of place, which includes arts and vibrancy. So we really need to figure out how to, def not define, but uh, value these contributors in such a way that they appear hard or more tangible to those that are assessing the effort and the tax money um, and the energy that governments put behind things. I'm Dan and I'm done speaking. Thank you, thank you, Dan, for that contribution as well. Now, it is 1226, but before I reset the room, I wanted to make sure, did anyone else on the floor have any thoughts they wanted to add to the conversation or anyone in our audience really quick? Ryan would like to join us on stage. Okay, we'll get Ryan on the stage. And uh, Ryan, welcome back. Did you want to yeah. the conversation? Thank you. I just wanted People to just uh, kind of elaborate on what Laura said, because uh, so when... When, you, when she divided, let's say, the investment aspect from the community development aspect, I think, I think there is, I think there is a, a very strong bond between these two aspects because number one, uh, when we're looking at the BRNE or the FDI uh, type of work that is being done in the community, it always builds upon the 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 what is individual about what is particular about that that community. So, in a sense that one has to know thyself before uh, before building, you mean, a solid uh, FDI or BRNE platform. So, I don't know, for me, I, I see both of these, like the community aspect and the, the investment aspect is, is very much intertwined. Really, really good point as well. And in fact, that was going to sort of jump into our next chat uh, a little bit later in the conversation. Thank you, Ryan, for adding. Um, I just want to really take a second, reset the room. I know we've had some folks jump in as well. Um, so uh, let me start with that. Um, so for those of you that aren't aware, this is the Economic Development EcDev Network Room. Today we're talking about community development in celebration of Interna International Economic Development Week. My name is Bob Minhas, and I am the co-host with my other co-hosts, Dan Taylor and Lara Fritz. And I work with economic development teams to help create knowledge economies for their business. Now, for those that aren't aware, this session is being recorded. Our co-host, Dan, is amazing at leveraging it again as a podcast for others to tune in and listen to, especially overseas that are probably asleep right now. Um, we have some amazing speakers here on stage. To, so to the audience, if you haven't done so yet, be sure to check out the bios of the folks on stage and follow them. They're likely in other clubhouse rooms contributing some amazing knowledge as well. So you want to make sure that you're not missing out on that. If you're hearing the subject today on community building and you're really loving the topic or want to, uh, to share this with your friends, family, work, associates, etc., on the very bottom, there's a plus sign that if you add uh, hit that, that'll allow you to uh, invite or ping others into the room as well. Uh, and if you do want to participate on the bottom, you'll see a hand and a, a notepad icon please feel free to use that to raise your hand and that'll allow us to uh, myself laura or dan to bring you on stage to join in the conversation just keep in mind when we do that your mic does go on live so as soon as you come on stage you want to hit mute right away and if you are new to the stage just keep in mind if uh, some little tips and tricks if you use the mute button on and off really quick it uh, represents clapping Doing it really slowly represents that you have something that you want to contribute, so I can throw the conversation your way. And when you have shared something or a thought or a question, feel free to just use your name again and say, I'm done speaking. So for example, saying, I'm Bob and I'm done speaking. That allows the other speakers to know when they can sort of jump in as well, since this is a very uh, audio driven platform. And if you haven't followed the EcDev Network room here on Clubhouse yet, feel free to do that as well. So I want to throw it into the next question. And then, Emily, I want to bring it back to you because I know you've got some amazing knowledge here. But, you know, often when we talk about community building and economic, uh, sorry, community building, um, there really is this topic that comes up lately around technology as well. And I know that your focus is around community building, but I'd love to hear your insight into how you think technology 
is going to play or is playing right now in building communities. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, technology is providing to be a really critical piece of infrastructure in building communities. I think one great example is all of us being here in Clubhouse and me meeting so many amazing people through Clubhouse throughout the pandemic. I also work in a rural area where economic and community development are often integrated in the same function or same roles almost. And I think the advent of technology and remote work is making it easier for those who might have been city bound to move out to rural areas, whether it be three days a week or even permanently, because we can work remotely. Like I'm coming to you from my home this morning. And between that and all the different tools we've been using over the past year, and then we also have a way to connect with each other without having to be in person. We've seen ex increased accessibility of public meetings because we can zoom in, which means I can be at one end of my county in person tonight and call into a meeting at the other end on Zoom and be in two places at once, which is pretty amazing by any sense of the word. And it's just increasing accessibility for those who would otherwise be marginalized due to lack of access. That's a great point as well, Emily, in terms of making it accessible to anyone. There's communities being built all over that, you know, um, not everyone has the resources to build it from scratch. So thank you. Um, I wanted to throw the next question, uh, the same question around community building and technology to Sue. And for those that haven't met Sue yet, Sue has an amazing community she's built virtually with virtual events. And Sue, I know you've got some conversation to give on the topic of community building and tech. Well, thanks, Bob. Uh, so Sue Sutcliffe, World Event Center. Um, I've been building communities since um, I got on the internet, really. Uh, back in 93, I discovered the internet and and, um, and it just kind of evolved that way. And as a result, I got really involved with uh, economic development departments and, um, and, and just love how all the pieces kind of come together with that sector. Um, of late, I've been working um, a virtual event platform called World Event Center that that basically gathers people online like never before. Um, but there's lots of platforms out there. Um, and, and I agree with what so many of you are saying about the, the different uh, parts and pieces that make up space um, and make it a great place to live. And I think really, um, you know, I've been following Richard Florida as well for years um, and, and other people that talk about the power of space. And I think honestly, there's, um, that we're, we're only just beginning to connect the dots now. I, I, I feel like the answer to this pandemic is really getting people talking and gathering somehow, some way, because, you know, the big companies want to come to a place that, um, that feels good, that their employees are going to be happy at and stay at. I think the motives of people and um, where they live, I think the flexibility with remote working is now here. So it's really going to be all about space. And uh, that means that, that the economic development world is just so, so absolutely critical right now. So that's Sue Sutcliffe and I'm done speaking. Really great points as well, Sue. Thank you for sharing that. Dan, I, I want to throw this question out to you. Innisville, home of the pay your property taxes with Bitcoin. I'm sure you've got some things to say about community building and technology and its influence. Well, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, and I'm going to go to maybe even our more uh, famous and maybe more powerful use of technology. So uh, half a dozen or so years ago, the municipality, which is uh, the size of Mississauga, uh, for those that aren't familiar, huge, huge square mile piece of geography, um, but uh, heavily unpopulated, 40,000 people is when you look at public transit as a rural community, um, as you can appreciate, public transit um, is expensive from a capital and an operations perspective. And even in urban areas, like the, the capacity, like the percentage of usage, it's not significant. I think it's maybe like 30% in a, in a really good community when you, when you factor 24 hours a day, seven days a week, et cetera. So it's really expensive. Um, so uh, our community decided to look at ride sharing as a way from which to offer public transit. And because uh, Uber was already in the ride sharing business and arguably 
I'm going to oversimplify things with a flick of a few switches and a couple of engineers reprogramming things. You could modify their app. And that's exactly what happened is we created a Innisfil transit system. We brought Uber drivers to the community where there were none before. And we worked with Uber to create what we believe is the first ever, if not the first ever rural um, transit system globally using Uber Rideshare. And we, uh, not unlike other transit systems, subsidize the rides. And then as you can appreciate, uh, we, can, we build data. So we understand where the point to point uh, travel is so that in the future we could decide, uh, we could judge volumes, we could judge routes, and we could make other decisions uh, on whether or not it made sense to create a hybrid model or move away from that model and invest in transit altogether. And the, the upfront investment was minimal uh, and um, in the time of a pandemic because we pay per ride because usage is low, unfortunately, but also our costs are low. So our costs only rise when um, usage rises. And when usage rises, it means people are using public transit and it's building a case for other models. So it's a fascinating look at using technology that didn't exist even just a handful of years ago. I'm Dan and I'm done speaking. Yeah, thank you, Dan. That's a really good point about interconnecting in rural communities. You know, obviously pre-COVID, uh, there was something to be said about physically connecting with people. So I, that the idea of using Uber to fill that gap is wonderful. Laura, can I throw it to you? You've worked with a few different agencies in the U.S. And, and so when we talk about community building and tech, what's your thought? When I think about community building and tech, I really think about um, community engagement and how we engage our residents um, to be part of our economic development efforts. And, you know, there's communities across the U.S. that are doing some really cool things. Uh, for example, Seattle has a, an app that they've developed called Find and Fix It. So if you see a pothole, you take a photo of it, it sends it to Public Works, they can send somebody out to fix it. Um, Boston has a 311 system where you can get information um, directly from uh, the city about a question you have you know, regarding the city. Um, and then, you know, I think one of the ways that I really love to use technology in community engagement is through surveys. What better way to find out what people are thinking than to ask them? Um, and so in Salt Lake City, we did a couple of different surveys. We did a survey of residents to understand what their priorities were. Um, and then we used that data to uh, increase the sales tax by 0.05% to fund four things that came out of the survey. Um, affordable housing, public safety, infrastructure, and I think the fourth was parks, if memory serves me. Um, so what a great way to get directly from the residents what they wanted to see their sales tax dollars being invested in. The other way that we used surveys was in business retention. Um, not only did we go out and meet with 250 companies over a two-year period, but we also did an electronic survey. And then we utilized that survey data to help craft a plan of work for the department that really met the needs of our business community. And that's where we really realized that we needed to be more than just looking at the big projects. We also needed to be supporting our neighborhood businesses as well. And that really came out of the survey. The other piece that came out of that survey was the need for assistance with workforce. All of our companies were struggling with finding talent and the state had amazing programs to support our, our local businesses, yet the business didn't know how to tap into them. So we brought a staff person in specifically to help make those connections to help find talent within the community. So um, that's just one way that we use technology in Salt Lake City and some of the other communities in the country. I'm Laura Fritz and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Laura. Some really interesting insights about technology actually influencing community building from that perspective for good. Um, really quick, I wanted to double back, Dan. Did you uh, want to add to? Yeah, thanks, Bob. I, uh, the name of the company escapes me right now, but we're, we're in discussions with a, a global software company. 
Uh, and what they do, I'm going to use layman's terms because it's the easiest way for me to explain it, is they are able to uh, scan uh, publicly available data on various social media platforms to get a uh, public opinion. So I think we're all familiar with not in my backyard and the greasy wheel, uh, or the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So often in, in communities, there's a small handful of people that may have an opinion that can influence counsel or decision making. And this tool, and I'm, again, I'm, I believe I have it correct, ethically, so, you know, um, not through breaking privacy laws, scans what's going on in Twitter and in Instagram and Facebook, etc., and is actually able to provide the temperature of the community on, on X, Y, and Z issues. So I think it's just another way of technology helping to serve the community better and inform better and help make better decision making because and get a better read on the community itself. I'm Dan and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Dan, for that ad as well. Um, it's 1241. So you know what, I'm going to move on to another question. Oh, Bob, can I oh, just yeah. jump in? Um, Dan, was it Meltwater or Scission that you're talking to? Because those are kind of the two big ones okay. that do the social media listening, so to speak. This one's out of Israel, uh, and I'm not sure that those two names don't ring a bell. So maybe there's other great ones that I'm not aware of. Dan, yeah. <laughs> Right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I have to unmute myself. I said uh, this company that I'm referring to is out of Israel, uh, and the two names that you're mentioning um, don't ring a bell. So I'm glad to hear that maybe there are others as well. Yeah. And then uh, tomorrow uh, we have for Economic Development Week a specific conversation about technology and economic development. And Steve Jast will be joining us from Gazelle AI. So that should be a great conversation about technology and economic development tomorrow at noon. I'm Laura Fritz and I'm done speaking. Wonderful, I'm looking forward to that discussion as well, Laura. So uh, 1242, let me move on to our next question, which uh, it sort of ties into our last conversation we had uh, last week when we talked about financing. But when we get into community building. And, you know, I'm sure many of you have worked with uh, community groups that may struggle for funding or to really figure out how to make their organization um, financially applicable. So, you know, I'd love to hear some advice or some tips or some best practices on what you've seen in terms of community groups creating funding models. And I think Lara had an example earlier in the call, but I'm actually gonna throw this one over to Brandon, and I know he's not expecting it, but I am, I am, I know from experience that groups in culture and tourism often face this challenge is, you know, how are we uh, building our communities around something and how are we funding it? Uh, Brandon, would you feel comfortable jumping in on that conversation? I definitely feel comfortable. I was like, you know what, I'm like, I'm looking forward to hearing some responses on this. And then all of a sudden, this row came. Um, I'm, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, apology for for being late. Uh, that big day for us. We're actually launching a new merchandise uh, line for Durham Tourism. So we've got um, a new product line that features. You know, we've got 22 different icons from various municipalities, hamlets, or towns, and and it's going great. But. Um, I've seen a lot of innovation in ways that community groups, and sometimes it's hard, especially as being in government organizations, and sometimes we're not always able to fund community groups that are also receiving funding from other revenue streams or funding from our government organization could actually impact any grants that they're able to receive. So you have to be mindful. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. I, I wouldn't mind going on mute right now because I, I can't think of something that adds value, and I know we're, we're tight for time, so I might... I just sit back and listen to this one and maybe Dan or Bob, I can send a follow-up message when I think of something and maybe you can add it in the notes. But um, yeah, I really don't have anything that's jumping out right now and I know we're, we're tight for, for time. So um, Brandon and I am done speaking. Thanks. No worries, Brandon. I threw you on the spot there. Jason, I saw your mic open up and then I'd love to throw it to Sheena and then Debbie, our newest on stage. Jason, please go ahead. Great. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I'm really interested in this topic of, of you know, as an economist, and trying to crowd in investment and get the more longer term, you know, the patient capital, uh, community participation to kind of coalesce and then move together on ideas. I'm, I'm really fond of the 
Opportunity Zones Initiative. I know it's uh, a U.S. initiative. It was done through the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 uh, to identify tracks that, you know, census tracks in the United States that had been historically kind of left out of investment. And we've got a number of people, um, you know, Steve Case, the original founder of AOL, talks about um, the rise of the rest and, you know, how so much of the investment is in New York and Massachusetts and California and not really spread. But, the, you know, as we know, there are you know, people everywhere. So it's trying to, you know, get the community to, you know, rally, organize around around uh, the most important projects and topics and then bring investment in and this you know opportunity zones initiative if you it gives tax incentives uh to you know for, for capital gains you know so if you're traditional kind of wall street capital gains or you know if you sold assets at any any other assets if you invest them in these so-called opportunity zones these tracks and you hold the money longer five seven ten years you get tax advantages, including, you know, if you hold it for 10 years, you don't pay any tax on the appreciation of that investment if you if you held it for 10 years and it's appreciated. And I've worked on the Opportunity Zones you know, around, around the U.S. starting here in Colorado, but I'm working in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan right now. And, you know, the most populous city in Upper Peninsula of Michigan is, is a town called Marquette, Michigan. And I've just really seen them come together in just, uh, I would say, six to nine months when they really weren't looking at this opportunity zones as an, as a possibility or in, you know, much value or to having confidence in it to really kind of, you know, organize around it with their community development, financial institutions, and then getting their state and then reaching up to the federal government to get more and more people rallied to bring investments in for what they would like to do. And that's uh, what they'd like to do. There are many things there, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. So th thank you for the opportunity to speak on that. Thank you, Jason, for adding that thought as well. Uh, Sheena, did you want to jump into the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. I know that there's a lot of municipalities right now, especially within cultural funding, that are trying to figure out where the gaps in uptake are. Um, and when they've looked at it, they've discovered a couple of things. A lot of it is just lack of knowledge about these different programs and funding that's available. And um, just the inability to be able to access the funding because of um, certain barriers or restrictions. So for instance, the city of Vancouver has just re recently released a music fund that allows um, individuals and collectives to apply that don't have business numbers because they're realizing that people didn't have these business numbers and it was stopping them from applying for these funding. Um, another one, just uh, finding out where these programs are. Uh, I have a friend who runs a nonprofit and she specifically uh, goes out to the community and reaches uh, key stakeholders in the, in the community to let them know about these granting programs. Um, and then she goes ahead and then she tries to teach them uh, different ways to be able to access the funding, kind of like the, the, the tips and tricks. And she's also been kind of employed by a municipality to, to, to do this, to, to let the community know. Uh, my name is Sheena, and that's it for me. Thank you. I love that, Sheena. That's, those are some really great programs that we could look at emulating for sure. Uh, Debbie, you joined us on stage some time ago. I'm sorry. I wanted to come around and, and welcome to the stage and ask if you wanted to add to the conversation. Hi, thanks for having me. Sorry, I was also late. It's been a day. Um, but yeah, I'm Debbie. I run Shenandoah Community Capital Fund. We're an entrepreneur support organization servicing the Shenandoah Valley. And one of the ways that we've been able to generate funding for the region in terms of ESOs is back in 2019, our operating budget was 135000 And for this upcoming fiscal year, it's 775000 um, that growth is specifically attributed to our transition from Main Street and lifestyle business support to really looking at the ecosystem holistically. And so what we've done is positioned ourselves as one of the lead conveners of the ecosystem that can create additional on-ramps for other programs. So we launched the first accelerator incubator for the region with the hope that more accelerators and incubators will come to our region and get started and going. And so creating these spaces for this innovation to happen and creating these on ramps and serving as this ecosystem builder and lean convener uh, for the region has allowed us to grow exponentially and find additional funding opportunities because it has now led us to be a region wide organization that actively collaborates with all the other partners in the region. And so now that helps us funnel money to our partners as well as 
uh, find funding for ourselves to uh, maintain the entrepreneurial ecosystem builders that we have. We have two with that title. Um, and then we have a couple other staffers on board to help with the storytelling and uh, other initiatives that we do across the region. So we specifically attribute that growth to really transitioning to an entrepreneur-led economic development region uh, and working to bring our municipalities and other partners to the table and get the attention of the state. Thank you, Debbie. I got to ask you if you could repeat one thing. You said something that was so, so, I loved it. You said Main Street support and uh, Main Street and lifestyle support. So there's an amazing amount of organizations in our region that will do a business model or um, business plan development from the SBDCs to other small businesses that are doing that type of support, um, as well as the lifestyle consultant and, and things like that. So we have these really robust organizations from Main Street organizations and economic development offices to the SBDCs already doing that work. What we found when we did a gap analysis is there's very little support for scalable businesses and innovation around business models. So when we started leaning into that work, it allowed us to look at the ecosystem holistically and really find out, oh, okay, well, we don't have to duplicate what the SBDC is doing. We don't have to duplicate what the eco other economic development offices are doing. We can move into this role to hopefully create more interest around this area and start to grow this area of our ecosystem. So once we started getting out of the the mindset that we had been in for a very long time, it allowed us to grow exponentially and very quickly. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, that really, really caught my attention. Thank you. Um, so just to reiterate the question, because we've had a couple people join us, including Jimmy on stage. And Jimmy, I wanted to throw this question to you. Emily, did you want to add to the conversation? <laughs> I like what Debbie is saying, just said about not duplicating efforts. In my area, we've seen a lot of chambers combined with EDOs in, just because of convenience. And I'm noticing like a lot of people doing essentially the same thing, especially in times when funding is scarce and hard to come by with municipal budgets being stretched by the pandemic. I think one thing, one piece of advice I would give to community building groups is first see who's already doing what you're doing that you don't need to see start your own thing and see what other groups you can partner with. Um, one common trend that I've seen among two different people in this room, one on stage and is the applying for federal grants like the build, which does require a coalition and seeing what coalitions you can build to get funding instead of trying to do everything by yourself. It's absolutely critical to work with partners to get funding, especially when the partners have staff or know-how in managing state or federal grants, which can be a pain to report on. Really good insight as well, Emily. Yes, I think collaboration in an ecosystem uh, is definitely fruitful in building a community. Thank you for making that point as well. So the topic on hand, Jimmy, I wanted to throw this out to you is we're just finishing off on by talking about uh, community building and funding and finances. And, and you and I had a, a chat last week, but I'd love to hear your insights if you've seen any best practices on how are local community groups outside of economic development able to build or fund uh, the work that they're doing? Have you seen anything amazing in your area? Hello, Bob. Um, I think in Texas, what we see a lot of are community foundations, like within the community itself. Um, we can also partner with larger groups, but a lot of times our communities will start a community foundation and then they tie those to their economic development organization even though they're like a 501c3 um, and they utilize that to uh, finance projects but of course that's a little bit more of a long-term solution and hopefully somebody else may have already said this because I jumped on a little late but um, yeah they, they tie that and it just takes a little bit longer though to build those so like for instance we don't have one and we've been talking about it for 10 years to start one but um, we need to get started on it because it is it's a, such a long-term investment so that's jimmy i'm jimmy and i'm done talking thank you jimmy that's wonderful that's some great insight there as well i just wanted to throw it to the floor um em uh what we heard from emily sorry i was gonna say we we pretty much heard from everybody but did anyone want to add as well to the conversation we're talking about community building. Well, we've still got some time, which is great, 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to throw in just a bonus question really quick. Um, when we talk about community building, uh, what I'd really love to hear from our, our folks on stage is this idea of um, 
how do you know when you're ready to build a community? And let me clarify that question. You know, a lot of times we we are engaged in activism. Somebody says we have this problem or this challenge or we need to resolve this issue. But community building is more than just something that you respond to. Community building is something, in my opinion, anyway, that you're building to to last, to, to have some duration. So I guess that's the first question is when you're looking at starting to build a community, whether through economic development or whether someone's approached you outside of economic development, are there first steps that you look for? Are there first things that you begin with? Um, Dan, do you mind if I, I throw this to you when you've built a number of initiatives there for the bill and your consideration of Prince Edward County? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bob. So I kind of go back to where this conversation touched on quite a bit, uh, which is uh, engagement, you know, talking to stakeholders, I guess we could use a bureaucratic word, or people, right? Community is really all about people. I, uh, one of my favorite, it's really kind of a down home example, uh, is, uh, I wanted to start a maple syrup festival, uh, a long time ago in Prince Edward County in a rural community. And so I went to the key maple syrup person and asked him if he was interested. And he said, he'd be interested in literally sitting around a kitchen table with a handful of other maple syrup producers. Um, I also brought a a festival organizer who had uh, created a, a loyalist festival. So loyalist is a is a type of uh, two hundred year old immigrant that came from the U.S. to Canada who were loyal to the crown. Anyway, long story short, is she had skills in putting festivals together, and uh, so we built uh, a pond community. So there was already a loose maple syrup community. There was already a a community within our community. And we built this new community of, of, of celebrating, you know, ag agriculture. It's actually interesting. I, I learned and, and never thought about it. I mean, it's indigenous, right? Uh, so it's the native people's first crop. of the, So it's the first agricultural crop of the season. It's a, it's a historical crop. Uh, but long story short is the people came together and they decided that this was a good idea. And everybody had a little bit of skin in the game, which I think is important in community building, some form of skin in the game. And I, I've shared this before, uh, a, a destination marketing organization ran that event for a while. Unfortunately, they went out of business. Uh, COVID has come and thrown challenges. And 18 years later, the festival still happens because I think there's this sense of community and uh, common interest in celebrating this crop and and heritage and culture and commerce. Uh, so I'm Dan and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. I know that um, Jen raised her hand to join us. So I'm just waiting for her to jump on stage. But Lara, can I throw it to you then on, on this topic? I think that the question you asked, Bob, was how do we know when it's time to do community building? Yes. So how do we how do we know when you know? <laughs> If you have to ask when it's time, you're already too late. Oh. Um, <laughs> I think that it's important to always be thinking about how you're building your community, whether we're doing that by working with stores and restaurants or we're looking at cluster development to continue to grow an industry sector in our community, we always need to be looking at how that is going to impact our communities. And so I, I would say you should already be doing it. I'm Laura Fritz, and I'm done speaking. Really great point, Darren. Thank you, Laura. Did anyone else want to contribute to the question? I didn't want to poke anyone. Emily and Demi, as the, sorry, Emily and Debbie, as our, our resident experts, would you like to jump in and weigh in on on the the question, Debbie? I really don't have much to say other than what Laura just said. Of if you're asking when to start community building, it, it's too late. Um, I think one of the coolest things in particular about entrepreneurial ecosystem building is it's the intersection of economic development and community development. So you really start finding that magic because uh, for a really long time, our organization said, oh, we're here to create economic vibrancy. And then when we sat and we thought about it, we're like, wait a second, we're not the ones creating the economic vibrancy, it's the entrepreneurs. Um, and so when we really started shifting to that entrepreneur centric focus and saying, how can we support these individuals that end up creating the communities that we want to live in? Uh, we found that our work hit 
uh, in the way that it needed to. And so always remembering that having a traditional economic development mindset is needed and then having that entrepreneur led economic development mindset is needed and then making sure that that integrates with all of the other partners that exist in the region. So you're really putting together economic development and community development on a consistent basis. Thank you, Debbie. Pointed that out as well. And Laura? Jen, I do see your hand up, Jen. I am having a problem getting you up to the stage. So maybe Me too. One I, of, was, I was trying. You're to trying to? Yeah. But oh, it... it's because she can't join right now. Okay. All right. Well, Jen, when you're ready, just go ahead and re-raise your hand and we'll make sure to get you up here. I'm Laura Fritz and I'm done speaking. Okay. Thanks, Laura. We're all learning. <laughs> policies and procedures of Clubhouse. Well, I just wanted to throw it out to the floor then at this point. So we've talked about this idea of community building and the goal of these calls, the goal of these chats that Lara and Dan and I want to do is create conversation among all of you who have questions. So really this is just an open call to the floor. Who has questions about community building or challenges? Maybe they're in the process of it now. Emily. I think one thing that's just critical is before you go out and this is something I've been guilty of, before you go out and start, kind of start your own thing, Make sure you look at what's already being done. I think people can get carried away with community building while forgetting about doing the gap analysis that Debbie mentioned, which can be absolutely critical because you don't want to duplicate efforts. And just make sure that if someone else is really passionate that there isn't already like a Main Street organization or a Chamber of Commerce or EEO or another art society that you can't tag on to at first before you determine the need. Just before you try to do something by yourself. Really and good. I'm Emily, and I'm done speaking. <laughs> Wonderful, really good point. Jason, did you want to ask the question? Yeah. So on, on your earlier question about when is it time? I mean, you know, it, I agree too. I mean, obviously, uh, it's always time, but there's also this issue of of the the right sized community or the you know the pro the particular project that you're working on because you know sometimes you're you do believe that what you're doing is the right thing to do but it's just a dead end street uh, for you know it could be you know the municipal government or you know the uh, the city council you know specifically or some some thing and so you know I'm I'm just kind of curious I just throw this out there too I mean. Um, it's, it's much easier. Like I said, I'm working with a small community in, in Marquette. I mean, small 21,000 population, Upper Peninsula, but I'm based in Denver. I mean, these are totally different worlds. You know, um, I you know, worked in Johannesburg where, you know, it's, you know, in a whole other element of trying to get something done. So, uh, you know, you have to pick your spots. And so I'm just, uh, I, I can sympathize with your question, Bob. And I mean, it resonates with me is like, you know, sometimes you just can't do what, is the right thing to do. So you go find somewhere else to do it. If you're, if you have the opportunity to do that with different communities. So I'm just curious from the panel about size of community uh, as part of the community building effort. Great question. Thank you, Jason. So the question here on the floor to the, the group here, if I understood it correctly, Jason was, you know, when you're looking at an urban center and a rural center, how does that influence community building? Is that fair? Did I get that? Right, Jason? Yeah, and it could, could be particular to, to what you're trying to accomplish. Is not everything is the same. Well, but yeah. Thank you. Lara, can I include you in that conversation? Sure. So I, I really enjoy, love this question, Jason, because, you know, there really are sort of different levels of effort, I think, that come with community engagement as part of our economic development efforts. Um, you know, if you think about rural communities, smaller communities, it feels like there's a, a larger opportunity for people to be engaged in the economic development work we do. Um, where I think at a larger community, it, to get to almost that street level takes a lot of staff effort and a lot of street time. Um, but thank goodness for technology, that's definitely helping to bridge that gap where people have new ways to become engaged thanks to technology. Um, but I would say that I have seen huge levels of interest in economic development projects, um, you know, from both running a, a Main Street program, which, you know, has rural ties, and you definitely, people can feel the impact at a, a Main Street program almost instantaneously, and so I think they have a 
uh, residents have an opportunity to become more engaged in that effort. Where some of the larger projects I've been involved in in bigger cities, I think it, there's the handful of people who are sort of the vocal. Um, I hate to say, you know, it's always the vocal minority, um, but it is a vocal minority that will come out against anything you propose. And so often we don't hear from the from the non-vocal majority. And again, I'm hoping that technology will continue to help bring out voices beyond just the no's. And I'm Laura Fritz and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Laura, for that insight as well. Uh, Nigel, Nigel's just joined us on stage. Nigel, did you want to add to the conversation as well? Hi, how are you doing, Bob? Hello, Clubhouse members. Um, yeah, I was just listening to um, the great conversation everyone has been contributing um, in this room. Yeah, so I just wanted to just, um, I just kind of reached out to Debbie. Maybe she could help me with some questions that I might have later on if she's able to. I know I would just um, listen to um, Jason, how he was speaking about different communities, I guess, in other countries and here in the U.S. But going back to what I'm working on, I'd actually started as a hobby working on renewable energy projects uh, in my yard. And then um, I'm somewhat retired, father of three and a grandfather now. So I'm just pretty much um, stuck between a rock and a hard place to try and scale out the project that I'm working on, with grandchildren, COVID, and um, not being able to, how should I say, um, where I'm at in New York, you really can't scale out a project that I'm working on like this. It's a bit too, um, a uh, little bit more disruptive, if anything, because it uses um, energy, uh, it produces energy with a gravity-based system, as this picture shows. It was a little prototype that I had to knock down before before the COVID or during COVID because we lost the lease on the property. But um, yeah, so I was just wondering, you know, Jason, how did you um, find that project out in Minneapolis? Because I'm trying to see where else in other communities I can scale out a project that can work with underserved communities or I guess in that sense, again, I'm not an um, a entrepreneur, just a, um, a hobbyist, like I said, trying to support planet people and um, making sure that I make an impact on this planet before I leave and I and my kids or my grandchildren say, hey, grandpa, I saw you working on projects to help and or slow global warming. Why didn't you do something? Why didn't you say something? So that's where I'm at with that. If that makes any sense, but that's all I have, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Jason. Did you want to take that? Part? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think uh, you know, I think Emily mentioned it. It's been talked about a little bit. You know, I think Debbie. Uh, the, I guess these, uh, the growth of the, what do you call them? The shared spaces, the other entrepreneurship centers. I mean, they're good to check in with because these are this entrepreneurial movement and what you're talking about, Nigel, is, is very entrepreneurial and, you know, yeah, anything on, well, especially with technology, uh, it's, you know, disruptive technology in particular, you've got to community to understand the benefits, you know, or uh, resources that are available and, and, you know, it takes convincing, it takes consensus building, it's more than kind of a one one on one opportunity thing. You know, the whole communities kind of kind of come around together around a solution and find its place. Uh, and if it's not in that place with that community, I mean, it could be with another community that fits better. And so, you know, I mean, I, I always had the difficulty, too, because I worked at the federal level. I worked with states. Now I'm working more with local governments and, you know, then all kinds of different organizations. And it's it's uh, I find that the best kind of uh, communities are the ones where really identify these entrepreneurship centers that have, you know, they're, they're not just like whimsical uh, entrepreneurship centers started just by a private enterprise. It's really kind of, you know, got public participation in it, you know, and, and they bring, you know, speakers in and so you just have to engage with that. And then with the technology, we can do that better. Um, they just a lot more, they, instead of having just person in person meetings, now everyone's, you know, constantly broadcasting so uh, i've really found it beneficial over the last year of seeing more online movement with with local communities and these entrepreneurship centers those are just some of my thoughts thank gotcha. you Th thank you thanks for that input appreciate it thank you jason and nigel if i can add this it's 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 a bit of an oversimplification but uh i find that uh, when i worked in economic development in rural communities and we were looking for for existing programs because maybe we weren't funding 
Uh, I was a huge fan of Google Alerts. So if you go to google.com slash alert, you can actually set it up so that it notifies you on a regular basis when new programs come to, to be. The trick there, Nigel, is you need to know the right words. Is it funding? Is it granting? Is it So it, it can get a bit cumbersome, but you know, I, I would use search terms like funding program, and, and we were very local, so it could be funding program um, Midland or funding program Barry. And it was, uh, it was one way of sort of me staying on top because generally, not always, but generally, uh, these agencies, when they get funding, are, are it's, I think it's actually a requirement that they sort of put a call out, if you will. So that could be helpful too, but it, you may have to sort of spend some time breaking down what words are the right words to bring you the results you want. So hopefully that helps as well. Gotcha. Thanks again, Bob. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Nigel. My pleasure. Throwing it back out to the floor again. I, I, um, those of us, those of you that attend attend our regular sessions, we usually run them for an hour. But to celebrate International Development Week, we're going for ninety minutes. <coughs> Pardon me. So um, I wanted to see if someone wanted to contribute to the conversation still before we wind down. Jimmy, did you want to add something? Well, I wanted to add to your Google Alerts. Um, I've been doing that for years, and it's such a great help, especially when you're in a small community. And I even just keep one up for my town. So anytime that something comes up about my town, if somebody's in the news or something, it sends me a Google Alert, and I love that. And what I do is I turn around and I share it on social media, and I'm always the first one to share it. And like, Recently, our hospital administrator was leaving, and so I I got an alert that he had found a job in another town, and so I messaged him, and he's like, "How did you know that?" <laughs> so, of course, I didn't share that one until it was properly, you know, the time to share it. But those are so helpful, and I keep one up for grants that are in the area for funding, um, and and mine's pretty broad, like grants and taxes. Um, but sometimes it'll just and a lot of it that you get, you can just toss and it's not helpful, but you, your eyes kind of get used to looking at it quickly on what's helpful. And, um, you know, that's kind of your, can be your assistant when you have no staff. And so it's, it's, it's helpful. I need to update mine because they've been running for years and some of them are no longer needed. But, um, yes, I just kind of wanted to add to that, that I think that's a fantastic idea. Thank you, Jimmy. I can't tell you, uh, and those of you in Canada might appreciate this, uh, I can't tell you how many times I found out about funding from our provincial or our Fed level before they even announced it. Because usually what will happen is they'll put it on um, and then they'll start sort of talking and contacting agencies. So you're absolutely right. Sometimes I, I'm the first to base with, with one of these programs. So it is my favorite hack, if you will. But again, throwing it out to the floor, did anyone else have any ideas, topics, or conversations they want to include around community building. I think uh, I think we've maxed out or squeezed out the topic. I, I will add one more thing on community building. And if somebody's already said this, stop me. But one of the best ways that I have found, and y'all are going to laugh at this, but in my community, I have a lady that she's kind of a mover and a shaker and bringing her into my fold was the best thing that I've ever done. Like she, she grew up here. She has, um, let's see, she crosses all different socioeconomic, uh, backgrounds and she just, she reaches a lot of people and it, it really amazes me. So I can tell her something and it is on the wire. You know, she can get that information out the correct information because a lot of times in small communities it's the wrong information so if you can find that person in your town that is one of the fast ways to community building and making change and getting things done because i mean i can't even i can't reach the people that she can reach and she can do it fast so um it's kind of a you know that that's another really good hack so you got to find that person in your community that's a really, really good point. I think in marketing, we talk about influencers, but there are such things as local community influencers. And I know in many rural communities, it's it's generally the person that is, has been in that community for a long time and they're very active civically, but they're also very active in nonprofits. So I love that. That's a really good, great piece of advice as well, Jimmy. Thank you. How's everyone else doing on the topic? Maybe what I'll do at this point is, Laura, can I throw it to you to ask, um, you know, I think we're winding down now. What, what's our topic for tomorrow? What are we going to be chatting about tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern? 
Yes. So, so tomorrow, I'm really excited that Stephen Jast will be joining us. Um, many of you probably know Stephen from Canada. Um, Stephen has been involved in economic development for a long time. He is the president of Research on Investment, and he is also the president and CEO of Gazelle AI, which is um, a, a new tool, a relatively new tool in economic development. And he's going to come and talk about how technology is changing our field. So I'm really excited to have him join us tomorrow at noon and make sure that you're putting noon every day this week except for Friday which will be 3 p.m. because we have incredible speakers coming up this week. We have um, Chris Lloyd who is a site selector is going to come and talk to you about what do site selectors really need from economic developers and on Friday at 3 I'm so excited we have Jeff Finkel uh, the head of the International Economic Development Council joining us to talk about putting the I, the international, in the International Economic Development Council. And you're going to learn about all the great stuff that he's doing in Canada and Mexico. So if you have friends who you think should be involved in Clubhouse, please make sure that you're linking them to our room. And thanks so much, Bob, for having me give those promos. Totally my pleasure. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and then just a reminder, as you are inviting people, as Laura had mentioned, Clubhouse is now on the Android app. It is a limited distribution. So if you have a coworker that says, oh, I've got an Android phone, please have them private message myself or Dan, and we can look at how we can arrange an invite for them. Um, they're a little bit hard to come by, but we'll make it work. Thank you. Dan, any final thoughts before we end the room to the conversation? Thanks, Bob. No, I just wanted to mostly thank everybody for uh, a great engaging conversation i feel we're so fortunate to have such uh, participation and i think uh more than the points i'm going to make the two thoughts that i want to leave us with is one is this idea of um, integration or integrated thinking or holistic thinking uh, that uh, there's a huge fuzzy line in the middle between economic development and community development. So I think we should focus mostly on the, the fuzzy line part or the connective tissue. Um, and then the other thing uh, that uh, really jumped out at me is, you know, when is it the right time to do community building? And, and I guess the answer was now or yesterday, uh, <laughs> depending on the issue. So there's, I guess there's never a bad time and, and there's almost always a good time. I'm Dan and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Dan, for that insight as well. So on that point, I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow at noon. Uh, and again, if you have any associates, friends or colleagues that could benefit from joining us in the discussion, we would love to love to have them for sure. Thank you, everyone, for contributing your time and, and your thoughts and, and knowledge to this call. And we'll see you all tomorrow at noon. Thanks. Bye bye.